next panel discussion is on the intersection of GRC and technologies, opportunities, challenge, and best practices. To discuss this, I would like to welcome on stage Raghavendra Verma, Group Head Legal, Compliance and Company Secretary at ISON Group. Monica Sharma, Director, Legal and Compliance, Sukhut PTT, LTD. Ali Shakbar, Regional Director, Middle East and Africa at Zoho Corp. Thank you, everybody. So this session is governance, risk and compliance, intersection of governance, risk and compliance, and the technology. So since morning yesterday, we have discussing about technology, AI, data privacy. So we will we'll, we'll keep focus purely, purely on the governance and compliances and, uh, and the help, how technology is helping in, in governing, in the entire governance and risk management and compliance process. So, just give you the little uh, brief about the, what is the governance, what is the risk management and the co compliance. So, governance refers to the system of rules, process and structure through which an organization is directed, controlled or operated. Just briefly, risk management involves identifying, assessing and mitigating risk that may impact an organization. It is may be internal or external. And compliance means, everybody knows compliance means the compliance with about adherence to the law, regulation, industry practice, internal policy, policy and so on and so forth. So, last 10 years, we have seen that, that, uh, that how, how the world is moving. And uh, earlier, there used to be a time that one um, company is situated in one country and hardly going to move into the another country and very much uh, located in one country. But last 10 years, I have seen that even from the small, small countries, company is going global. So exposure to the so many jurisdictions, so many regulations, so many laws. And even this is the law firm. Law firm is also not only based on one country, and, and law firm is opening also opening branch to the different different com countries through franchise and whatever way. So this is exposing organization a lot because they are exposed to so many laws and so many regulations. So then I can. I can I will differentiate into two parts. One is the normal governance risk, is that traditional risk and compliance issue that, that we are dealing with the time removing. But this advantage, advent of the new technology, development of the new technology and exposure, and the organization exposure to the so many countries, a new type of risk has come up. Governance issue has come up, compliance is like data privacy like anti-money laundry, uh, compliance management, uh, contract management is also is going to be uh, uh, tougher and tougher day by day. Then. So technology is coming in our way to help help it out, uh, help us out, organization or the law. With this background, uh, I request Monica to uh, can you, can you put some light on how data availability, uh, sorry, so what is GRC and what data privacy is pretty impact in the market? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Verma, and thank you, Dexter, for giving this opportunity. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm honored and full that I'm sharing. Uh, can you hear me? Is, is, it, is it better? So I'll just quickly introduce myself. I am uh, uh, Director Legal Compliance at uh, Squad. Squad is an EOR company, and uh, we are a global company. So uh, we are uh, dealing data, dealing in data, huge. I mean, when we are dealing uh, in 65 odd countries, it means that we are dealing with 65 different regulations all over the globe. Data privacy is an important concern for everyone in the globe. Right. So we are, we are living in digital era where we are uh, uh, you know, uh, sending or receiving data all over the globe. When we are receiving across the globe, then there is a requirement to have uh, data privacy law. And I think uh, uh, UAE uh, people and the UAE uh, uh, government has introduced data privacy law and the uh, market has completely you know, accepted this with open arms. Why they have accepted this open arms? Because when we are dealing with the humongous data we are sitting on, it needs to be 
taken care of. Uh, I'll give you, uh, because since I'm dealing and I'm leading the uh, data privacy program in my organization, I'll just throw some light on the uh, practicality than theoretical here. So uh, in, in my organization itself, when uh, uh, we have employees sitting in different locations and we have uh, AWS sitting in uh, Singapore, uh, the, the data, the employee data are coming from different, different locations from EU. So we need to see uh, which law should be governed and which law we should be taking care of. These are the aspects we have to see. So we have to see all different laws of different countries and create a framework around it. And the most important aspect is that you know to create awareness in the organization itself. How to create awareness in the organization. So creating awareness is again another aspect that we need to throw some light like you know do some quiz and then create some training and uh, training program for the management, for the employees at large, and whatever, whatnot, we need to introduce this data privacy for all the employees in the organization. Once you are done with that, I think then create a data privacy program and framework in the organization and then see what a gap assessment we need to introduce here. And then once you'll have the gap assessment report ready and then start implementing it. This is how I think we should be introducing and implementing data privacy within the organization. Uh, it's it's not one-time exercise; it's a continuous exercise. It's an evolving, it's an evolving uh, thing that we need to ensure, right? Uh, this uh, this is how I understand the data privacy has been uh, uh, accepted by everyone and uh, should be uh, uh, should be taken care of by uh, by the organization, the management. Globally and uh, industry wide as well. I'll Thanks. Give a Thanks, Monica. So, so, how data is really important for the company while maintaining the cloud in the personal data? Can you throw some light on Sure. So, data usability is uh, one aspect, this may be one of the principles of uh, data privacy. Uh, data usability is important in terms of uh, effectiveness of the use of data. When we are saying that you know how much data and what data we should be collecting, when we are sitting in this digital uh, era where we are receiving data, let's say you know we are in the fintech space, we are uh, uh, when we are sharing data globally and sharing data through our mobile, through our laptops, everything, right? So we have no limitation the data we are receiving. The the uh, how we need to control and what we need to see here is the retention of data and then. Uh, whether we need this data or not within the organization, what will be the use of data, these are the questions we, which we need to answer. So the basically, you know, the cost of uh, cost of retaining data is also important that we need to highlight and we, should, we need to understand within the organization whether we need this or not. If will, because see, the cost of non-compliance is far higher than cost of compliance. And then you'll have more opportunity if you'll have, uh, if you are complying the law, if you are complying uh, the regulation you have within the organization, right? You'll have, uh, if you'll not be complying and setting on non-compliance, you'll, you'll lose the opportunity of business, you'll lose the trust of the com customers, so there's operational risk as well. Those are the risks that we are, uh, we can foresee and accordingly, you know, draft your program, accordingly draft your uh, framework around it, whether we need this data information within the organization, because it will leak out if, if the data if there is, there, there is this data breach, then we don't know where we are sitting on. Then the fine we will be uh, levied by the government. Uh, I'll just give you two examples. Like Amazon got uh, fined by, uh, I think, USD 851 million last year. Uh, again, in breach of uh, GDPR laws, right? Similarly, uh, WhatsApp Island as well got fined by uh, 251, approximately 251 USD million, maybe. Again, breaches of data, uh, uh, GDPR laws. These are the fines we are looking at. And then we should also see the cost of compliance. It's not much, right? So uh, this is how, when we are defining and understanding the compliance, we should see the uh, non-compliance uh, more uh, diligently than you know the the cost of compliance uh, will have the opportunities we have. Like for the data privacy point of view, from the organization point of view, when you're collecting the data, consent is is very very important. Consent plus the specific uh, purpose. So the purpose we are taking the consent. So, so these days people are using the technology to manage the consent. So our organization is doing some uh, taking the help of the technology to consent.
chain management or data minimization Yes, yes. So consent is of course important. When you are, uh, when law says that you need to take explicit consent, then explicit consent needs to be obtained, and we need to maintain that consent because you never know when uh, you'll have audit. Even audits, statutory auditor can also ask you for those consent, and then uh, even uh, regulators can also ask you to produce those consents. Let's say in your country, in India, we don't have law as of now, still in parliament. So we are maintaining consents as of now. In case you are maintaining data from for, for other countries, let's say from Europe, you have uh, data getting transferred with some other regulation you have. If you are not maintaining consents and they are asking you consent, then you are in breach, right? So maintenance and then taking explicit consent is very important. It's very important when we are uh, taking the data and keeping it in your record. Uh, we are taking all those consents online through system. When you are, see, it's all about technology, right? When we are uh, in my organization, the technology. technology that yes. Side yes. yes. So when we are lending, we are in digital lending space, mm -hmm. right? You are onboarding customers online. When you are onboarding customers, you can't go and take consents offline, right? You have to take it online. The requirement is to maintain those consents when you have it or not in place. So it's just that law doesn't stop you from digital lending or digitalization, but they are also uh, making you aware that law needs to be taken care of. And how you will take care of, this is very important. Right? This is what uh, I would say that we, we should be. Thanks, Monica. So uh, in my organization also we are taking, we are managing because, so we have two aspects. One is uh, we have 18,000 employees across uh, Africa and India by the list. And then the, we process at least, at least 70 million customer data monthly. So 70 million customer data, you understand that how big the data is and that we are also doing this consent management through API integration and, uh, and so the technology is really helping a lot to us about this consent management and then again the data minimization. Data minimization is should not retain the data much beyond the time period which is required. So for identification of the data, this, this is not, not required. This is all, I don't know how they do that, technology guys, but Algorithm has been fixed, and then after some time, you will say, "Okay, this employee has left your organization. You do not need to this data. Your tax five-year assessment has been done. You do not need this data." So something like that, they did it. Technology and it's really helping a lot. So, Mr. Ali, uh, when we are talking about the data protection, and uh, so data protection and privacy, we talk about data protection and privacy. Uh, is it legal or ethical question? Conversation. That's well, the, the, the whole topic of data collection and, and how we what we're collecting, why we're collecting it, and, and also what we're going to do with that and, and how we're going to maintain it, the whole spectrum of it, is an ethical dilemma as much as it's a business dilemma. And this is often overlooked intentionally most of the times I would say or unintentionally. In this day and age there is an immense power in the hands of technology companies. I mean we think we know how much power tech companies have but we're just scratching the surface. I represent a technology company. We are a software company, Zoho Corporation and we've been building software uh, on the cloud mostly for the past 25 years. 19 years ago announced 20 years ago. We put it in our privacy policy and we made it very easy for people to read and understand that we do not collect more than what we need. We do not own your data. We are just custodian of your data and we will not use it for any purpose, any purpose other than just processing your own data and giving you back the analysis or just storing it for you. This is something that is not happening and it's very alarming. And I would say because the ethics and morality of, of business models is flawed. Uh, you mentioned collection of data. You mentioned collecting consent about doing something with people's data. Oftentimes, these are so complicated, hidden behind a lot of legalese and intentionally written in size six type so people can't even read it or can't be bothered to be read it. 
So the behavior is driven, you know, of, 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 of the entire populace to make sure that uh, the least amount of number of people actually will object or even, ha or even have a question. So if we don't have something to hide, why are we hiding it? This becomes a dilemma here. Um, now with, with AI is even getting, this, this matter is becoming bolder and, and stronger. Yeah, you, if, you, if you listen to some of these speakers in the past few months, you know, this, uh, an AI innovation or announcement every week, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy. And they keep saying AI, and then they keep saying responsible AI. What does that even mean? I would say the executives who keep talking about responsible AI, they just do it for the sake of marketing and being on the safe side of law. Now, coming back to the ethics of it, there are a lot of lo laws and regulations, GDPR being the most famous, a poppy in South Africa, US has their own, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, etc., etc. India has their own. But there are always ways to circumvent the law. We have a lot of lawyers here present. That's a, that's a talent by itself. You define the law that you find ways how to, how that law does not apply to your company. So what are the ethics of it? How are we trying to do our business? In this room, if I get your consent and collect data, something very safe about your food preferences. Are you vegetarian, vegan, or omnivore? I could design the questions in a way that I nudge your behavior towards certain answer. And I will tell you, it's anonymous data I'm collecting. I'm not going to mention your names. I'm not going to collect your addresses. But I can take that anonymous data, analyze it in a way, and come up with the next step and drive your entire behavior towards what I want to sell to you. It is absolutely legal. But is it, is it ethical? Without your conscious, your subconscious doesn't know that this, you know, nudge is happening for you. So it is a more ethical and moral question than being a business question. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Ali, because very good. And uh, the ethical part, how they are circumventing your your privacy. That uh, you do some research on the mobile, on the Google search, and suddenly the same type of advertisement popping up your mobile. If you are going to some website and looking for some uh, shirt or some perfume, suddenly you will see that uh, the same type of perfume, the same, the same brand or same type of uh, shirt or clothes popping up your, your, your mobile. How they are doing that? They are doing a risk profiling, sorry, they are profiling without telling you that. They are watching you. If you have Alexa in your house, and uh, Alexa, you know everybody knows about Alexa and Siri. They are always listening you. Whatever you do, uh, I have faced this problem. Is um, I uh, with mobile in my hair and talking with my wife something, and suddenly after one hour, the same whatever I talk with my wife, the advertisement with related to that start popping on my Google. As soon as they open the Google, same advertisement is coming. So this ethical part is very, very important, and you, you rightly pointed out. And if I may, as scary as it sounds, these devices that collect your voice, they don't understand your, what you're talking about. They're sensitive to certain keywords. And they're actually, what they're doing is the safest way of abusing your privacy. They just want to sell you something. Um, we've seen elections being compromised in the West. Yeah. We've seen uh, uh, the entire population's behavior has been driven to, towards a certain way of thinking, aggravating societies. So that's where it becomes, you know, they're crossing the line. Uh, one of the major providers, I'm not going to mention names because they're our competitor, a uh, very large tech company, they started collecting medical information. Everybody agreed to the terms and conditions. Every single person who, you know, shared their data. The hospitals did, the people, the patients, everybody did. But they did not know what is going to happen to this data, how it's going to be analyzed and come back and bite them back. So it is a very tricky scenario. Absolutely. So, so moving, moving from that uh, data privacy, now like uh, I just uh, request you, like uh, we are facing, we are lawyers, we are facing 
the contract management aspect a lot of difficulty we are facing so i have personally i can i tell you my colleague is here around around 300 clients so 300 contact i'm just about talking about the clients leave about the vendors leave about the vendors so how to how technology can help me contract life cycle management thank you well if i may i'll use your company as an example 300 Uh, customers i would say probably in a year i'm i'm just guessing off the top of my head 900 drafts 1200 revisions negotiations storage of this data communicating between the stakeholders and of course we have we start digitalizing ourselves because work bec- workload becomes more technology is available uh, however that simplicity of the idea that you started with probably 5 years ago let's digitalize ourselves and be, become more productive adds so much to your complexity and a lot of this complexity becomes because you're dealing with more work more information and also we don't understand what's going on in the background we can't expect everybody to be a tech whiz it's impossible it's not your job it's not your core competency your core competency is law and how to deal with your clients and make them win now all of these documents start being collected and i can guess that in any company not just yours of course it even largest fortune 500 companies these files are start getting scattered the more scattered your documents the more your risk in terms of somebody leaves your organization if you have good offboarding process you take care of the cu- computer you put the file somewhere for them and and then off they go in case they took a copy on a usb stick uh forward it to their personal email with all the good in- intentions to work on the document overnight it's a lot of work legal work etc etc i can come up with hundreds of examples that adds tiny tiny drops of risk to the whole system and complexity so we have risk on the, on the one hand we have a lot of added complexity uh, which will uh, in turn increase the risk i mean you will start losing revenue uh, your costs will go up you with it yourself will be exposed to litigations and other complications a contract management software is designed specifically to take care of the entire life cycle because today we are using word or another word processor to to draft email outlook whatever service you're using to communicate between your customer and then version 26 of the draft god knows where it is whose inbox or outbox has has the latest version and and and, and then the invoices go somewhere in the accounting software which is guarded uh, like a fort there is no coherent connection between all of this flow of information which makes it again more difficult to become more productive the contract management software gives you the editor allows you to do, collaborate and and work on the draft internally get the approvals the process gets automated so you will never miss a, an approval <coughs> and then you send it out you start negotiating between you and your customer all of that is recorded a lot of good data points in the process are collected and then the contract gets executed let's say you're in the middle of the contract term and one of the laws and regulations change in the jurisdiction of that contract you change it once a notification can come and then you can apply to the draft or the contract that's being executed so it's day and night between not having such system and having a system like that in place and then you decommission the contract or the term ends etc etc and how this information gets archived based on the laws and regulations of which country is it going to be us military standard way of archiving your data can we extract that later for for uh, e discovery or other deliberations so all of this can be managed in one single solution centralization of data reduce risk definitely reduced cost in the short and long term um, and 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 protection of the data and a lot of transparency ultimately it drives behavior and change within the organization and with your customers yeah wonderful so that's that's really going to help and as a lawyer we people like really that as you explain i believe that i want to explore that because i'm really facing a lot of it i believe most of the people who are facing this issue 
So, we have very less time. So, one major aspect of this globe. Yesterday we have a topic on globalization of law. I know I don't know how many people we have present there. So, this globalization of law, globalization of trade and commerce, uh, uh, essentially uh, involves the flow of money from one place to another place. This flow of money uh, raises the issue of anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism funding. And this is another major aspect uh, as a GRC professional because I am taking care of my, my organization, the risk profile also. I am that uh, chief uh, legal compliance and risk officer. And uh, so, so we need to find out whenever we are contacting with any client or vendor, we are hiring some vendor, we are partnering with some IT people or something like that. Who is the UVO? UVO means ultimate beneficiary owner as an individual, not as a corporate. Who are the person behind this client or behind this company and behind this partner? And what is the source of the fund? Because the anti-money laundering is uh, uh, laws are very, very uh, stringent these days and the, every day the new law, they are updating this law as for the finding of uh, or finding some facts. So, all over the world uh, from the US point of view, from the US point of view, the anti-money laundering uh, law is very getting day by day very stringent. If and what is happening, I can tell you with my experience. I had a company in Myanmar, my company, not mine. My organization had a company in Myanmar. And uh, because of that company in Myanmar, I was not allowed to do banking with certain bank because Myanmar at that point of time in the sanction list. So because of this anti-money laundering, right now Ukraine and Russia war is happening. I know that on a daily basis, new sanctions, sanction against individual, sanctions against uh, that firm, daily basis new sanction is coming like UN is sanctioning someone, US is sanctioning someone, uh, uh, IMF is sanctioning someone. So how to ensure that you are partnering with somebody who is not in that list? Otherwise, if you are doing the business with that, you are getting sanction also. So, so in that way, uh, in that type of case, the like due diligence, due diligence, customer identification, the source of fund, how they generate. I was exposed to few few uh, technology uh, technology. Uh, I don't take the name of that company. This not be very very helpful for identifying that. As soon as I put some name of the director and UBO shareholder, whole details, their criminal background, their credit worthiness, whether they are in the checklist of uh, any uh, any UN UN watch list or US watch list or under the financial uh, IMF watch list. All data is coming in front of me within a second. Within a second, that give you the the idea and that help you to get uh, take the informed decision about whether to go with this partner or not, whether should go with this client or not. So and uh, and whether you are and keep you protected. So this all automated like uh, and again for the banking people, I don't know uh, any banking uh, lawyer is here that uh, source of fund, how this source of fund, if you see that so many people, uh, when you are going to open a bank account, you have to fill the KYC form. In the KYC form, you give your all details, that your all background and the basis of that, they are doing the profiling and this all the software, mostly used by the financial institution to track the source of fund, transaction, how this transaction move, moving from the one country to another country to keep track on anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism funding. So, I, I found, I found this few software, I will not take the name, it will not be itself what you say, we will just talk about itself, so I am promoting one company, so, uh, but really helpful for anti-money laundering, anti-terrorism funding. So, we have very little time, just uh, I come Monka again to you, that uh, we talk about data privacy and the uh, feasibility. How to create awareness about that? Can you? Yeah. I mean, I've already talked about it, but the creating awareness within the organization is very important for data from data privacy standpoint. Since it's a uh, you know need of an hour, uh, we should be uh, doing some training 
you know, mailers, flyers within the organization. This is important. And this is ongoing exercise. It should not be just one time exercise. We have informed. We should not be consider this as theory. It should more taken as a practical uh, experience and experience for the organization and employees, right? Make them aware what is data privacy. Make them aware that why we need data privacy within the organization. They are dealing with the data, right? And uh, which is important to you. And if there is any breach or leak out, then how will that impact us? Not only the organization, even the employer, individual whose data is getting leaked out, right? So awareness through management, board, they should be aware of, they should get aware of, aware, we should creating awareness for them as well. Training sessions, as I said, mailer, flyers, we should do some posters as well within the organization. This is how we should create awareness within the organization. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. Uh, Shelly, you talk about the risk. Information is also the risk. So how to this risk of information uh, we can uh, convert into the opportunity? If I want to quickly divide that risk into probably a couple of areas, that risk, uh, information risk specifically, will impact our bottom line, uh, our livelihood. Again, we can be exposed to even legal litigations as a business. Um, and, 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 and also uh, take that competitive advantage away from us. So if we focus back in our organization, uh, wh where are we missing this information, uh, decentralized, scattered, not secured, uh, all of these uh, areas can be identified that, that poses a risk, which we, we can turn some of these weaknesses within, that, uh, within your business into, into strength which helps us to stay more competitive. So if you don't have a, let's say, contract lifecycle management software and system, it comes with policies and procedures, adopting that will put you in forefront of your competition. That, that's very important, which again, in turn, impacts your bottom line. Uh, in addition to that, it will help you close a lot of gaps and avoid a lot of pitfalls. So, by listing those risks, both weaknesses and threats, can easily turn them into strength and oppor uh, also uh, opportunities there. That's absolutely possible. One way is to adopt technology, but not just to go out. I mean, we have a booth there. We can come get a demo and we sell the software. But the thing is, that the thought process has to be there. That, that deliberation, that an introspection and organizational level has to be there. What are our risks? What are our weaknesses and threats that we are facing? And what is the competition is doing? And what can we do? Technology will answer a good number of those questions. However, how to do it is a, is a human process, is a people process. Wonderful, wonderful, Mr. Ali. And uh, really, this, uh, so many information these days everywhere it is available, uh, everywhere, and how to convert this into the opportunity is really a great skill. And uh, so this uh, time is giving us the warning that your time is finished. So, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I just stop myself here. But I request my panelists to give some closing remarks that uh, as we discuss about the DRC and the technology, how technology is helping us. One final comment from you, Mr. Ali. Well, I know everybody's waiting to, to go for lunch. And I have to thank you for staying back. <laughs> you're, you're real sports. Uh, no particular closing remarks, just repeating my point on focusing on process and the human aspect of your process and then adopting the right technology. We are happy to help you. We are happy to, to have, a, have a very you know, no strings attached conversation with you and see if it is suitable for you. But the point is to focus on the process and people and then technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys, so, for attending the session. And um, I, I would just say that you know it's a continuous process. Database is all about continuous process. And uh, as I said, the cost of non-compliance is far, far higher than the cost of compliance. So focus on compliance. And we should educate our board and management that compliance is important, right? It is important. We'll have risks and uh, the fines which are um, 
which I would say that mega fines right now, the current government are uh, levying on in case of non-compliance. So uh, we should be uh, stressing on those things when we are making our management and you know uh, board aware about the risk we are sitting on. Thank you, thank you, Mika. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Any question? Anybody? Any question? Or my panelist has explained everything beautifully. So there is no question left. Thank you. Thank you really, as Mr. Ali said, that uh, you got all due for lunch. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lex Talk, for inviting us here. Thank you, everybody.